Uh, let's look at something else. The evolutionist would suggest to us that when you look at the geological column, when you go to something like the Grand Canyon and you see all of those different layers, those layers were laid down over millions of years. That's more or less right, apart from one important detail. Evolutionists are not geologists. Evolutionary biologists study living organisms, not rocks. Paleontologists, on the other hand, study fossilized organisms in rocks. These are fairly basic details which will help my creationist friends to be more knowledgeable than Mr. Butt apparently is. Those layers were laid down over millions of years. It's not as simple as that. Sedimentary rocks form at different rates. Geologists know that. This can be figured out from the composition and grain size within the rocks in question. Deposition rates vary widely too, but geologists understand this and take it into account. Under an idea known as uniformitarianism, uniformitarianism is a big, you know, big word that means simply this. The present is the key to the past. That things operate now as they have always operated. Uniformitarianism is an assumption which is based on the lack of evidence to the contrary. For example, we assume that the speed of light and the force of gravity are the same throughout the universe because that is where all of the evidence points. We can't be 100% sure of this, but it would be absurd to assume differently, unless some compelling evidence for that came to light. And the evolutionist looks at how some things are laying down layers, sees how it is sometimes a very slow process, and says if one inch of this soil is laid down over ten years, then a foot of that soil must be laid down over, and you do the math. I don't think we're in a position to be able to do any maths at this point, especially as Mr. Butt is so confused about the difference between evolution and geology. In order to be able to critique science effectively, you need to at least be up to speed on the basics. And some of these layers, they would say, are multiplied millions of years old. They've got a problem when they say that. Oh, really? Sometimes we find fossils of, like, a fish or a plant or a well that will cut through several layers. These are called poly straight fossils. Poly meaning many, straight or strata meaning fossils that go through many layers. It's worth noting here that poly straight is a word which is used almost exclusively by young earth creationists. Geologists refer to these as upright fossils, which are usually sections of tree trunk. How in the world is a catfish going to stand on its tail for thousands or tens of thousands of years while these layers slowly build up around it? That's not what happens. If a fossil is upright, it's usually due to rapid deposition of mud, sand or volcanic ash. The fact that there are layers indicates that the build-up of sediments is not a continual, uninterrupted process. How in the world is a huge whale going to stand on its tail for hundreds or thousands or millions of years while layers build up around it. Is that a plausible explanation? No. The whale fossil which creationists refer to is not upright. It's tilted at an angle of about 45 degrees, which happens to be the same angle as the sediment layers. Thanks to the movement of plate tectonics, what was once horizontal is now at an angle. My creationist friends, why do you think Mr. Butt fails to mention these additional details? What happens to a whale when it stands on its tail for one year? It decays, it becomes almost unrecognizable as a whale. It certainly would never stand on its tail for 10 or 20 or 30,000 years while it is buried slowly over multiplied years? That's not plausible. Of course it's not plausible. It's a straw man. 
It's not what the paleontologists found and reported. Let me give you another example of how we know these layers were not laid down over multiplying millions of years. Notice how he said how we know rather than what we believe. Remember that false certainty I mentioned earlier? In the early 1980s, Mount St. Helens exploded. In that eruption, that volcanic eruption, a huge dam was formed. Several, several days and months after that, this dam broke and a huge mudslide proceeded to slide down the side of the mountain, a monumental, catastrophic mudslide in a single day. And as we would expect from Mr. Butt by now, many important details are left out. He didn't mention that the composition of the material eroded was unconsolidated ash and pumice gravel, whereas the Grand Canyon is mainly solid rock. The difference would be like turning a fire hose onto a sand dune and comparing it with the effect it had on a cliff face. It goes without saying that the sand would erode away quicker than the cliff. A cavern was carved out, a canyon was carved, that was almost exactly one fortieth to scale of the Grand Canyon in a single day. In fact, this canyon is known as the Little Grand Canyon. Well, how is it that in a single day you can look at this canyon and see multiplied layers that allegedly could be laid down over millions of years? But they weren't. They were laid down in a single catastrophe. A volcanic eruption, by its very nature, can eject material in fits and starts. This is why we find ash, pumice and lava in separate layers in different locations. They are superficially similar in appearance to the sedimentary layers found in the Grand Canyon, but any serious amateur geologist can tell the difference between a sedimentary layer and a volcanic one. Do you know of any catastrophe that could lay down uh, layers like you see in the Grand Canyon? on a larger scale than the eruption of Mount St. Helens? I do. Careful now, Mr. Butt. It sounds like you are claiming to know things which you merely believe. Again. Uh, one that you read about in the Bible. Noah's flood. The flood where the Bible says that the fountains of the deep broke open. Fountains of the deep? Given what we know about gravity, hydrology, and the volume of water on this planet, what exactly are fountains of the deep? I've never heard a good explanation of this from a creationist. That would cause cataclysmic geological formation and reformation uh, several times larger than the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Do I really need to point out that Mount St. Helens was a volcano, unlike Noah's flood? The Bible even says it was a flood. Not that that automatically means such an event happened in exactly the way biblical literalists believe it did. A very plausible answer to many of the layers that we see. Very plausible? According to who? Meteorologists? Biblical literalists? Geologists? Well, the evolution says, well, we can prove that the that geological column, the rocks, are multiplied billions of years old. You mean geologists. Isn't that right, Mr. Butt? Well, how can you do that? Sometimes people think that evolutionists use a dating method known as carbon-14 dating to give the millions of years of time that they need. That is, is simply not true. Jolly good. At least that misconception isn't being promulgated here. Carbon-14 dating cannot be used to date anything but once living material. In other words, the sample being tested has to contain carbon. And even the inventor of carbon-14 dating, W.F. Libby, said that it can only be used to date things in thousands of years. You mean tens of thousands of years. Radiocarbon dating has been calibrated to an accuracy of plus or minus a couple of hundred years back to about 50,000 years. To put that into context, that's nearly ten times further back than Mr. Butt thinks is the date of the supernatural creation of the universe. And in fact, we have discovered that it doesn't really even work all that well for thousands of years. 
who is we. And sometimes they would date using carbon-14 carbon dating freshly killed seals that give dates of over a thousand years or a living mollusk that would give dates over a thousand or fifteen hundred years. Sometimes they would date different particles of the same musk ox that would date seven thousand years differently. Who is they? It would be really helpful for the curious young creationist who has forked out some of their hard-earned cash to buy this DVD if Mr. Butt was a little more specific when he makes these claims. Anyone who has a basic understanding of radiocarbon dating should know that it is useless for dating mollusks and other aquatic creatures who build their body parts from anything other than fresh plant material. When a plant dies it no longer absorbs carbon from the atmosphere. So that is the point at which the radiometric clock is reset. Any aquatic creature which feeds off others in the food chain, which haven't absorbed their carbon from the atmosphere until the point of being eaten, is going to give a false reading. Once again, the scientists in these fields understand this and take it into account, unlike the young earth creationists. As for the musk ox, there seems to be confusion about the dates. Some creationists claim 17,200 years, while others claim 7,200. Also, it's unclear whether they are referring to musk oxes or mammoths. I would hazard a guess that there was contamination in the samples. So how is it that the evolutionists claim that they can get multiplied billions of years for Earth history? There is a new type of dating method that they would suggest to us proves this beyond the shadow of a doubt radiometric dating methods. This is so wrong-headed it's hard to know how to untangle it. Firstly, radiocarbon dating is one form of radiometric dating, specifically the one which measures the quantity of carbon-14 in a sample. Secondly, radiometric dating cannot be newer. It would be like claiming that bookshelves are older than books. It's an absurdity. They would say, yes, radiometric dating methods prove that the Earth is billions of years old. Now, like we said earlier, ironically, there have always been dating methods that have been suggested that prove the alleged age of the Earth, which do nothing of the sort. Scientists give age estimates, not proof. Unlike religionists, scientists rarely claim absolute certainty. And if they do, they're doing it wrong. But let's look at radiometric dating methods. They would say, yes, here's the process. Suppose you have a radioactive element like uranium. It breaks down into a daughter element like lead. The parent element being uranium, the daughter element being lead. Once again, Mr. Butt is drastically oversimplifying the science. It only applies to the isotopes of uranium-238 and 235, which decay into lead 206 and 207 respectively, involving a combination of alpha and beta decays. But for now, I will let Mr. Butt dig himself into an even deeper hole of ignorance. Suppose you have 50 ounces of uranium. Its half-life, that means the amount of time it's going to take half of that uranium to break down into lead, is supposed to be 4.5 billion years or so. That's only uranium-238. Uranium-235 has a half-life of 704 million years. The neat thing is that this allows the scientists to calibrate their methods and easily spot contaminated samples. Something else which Mr. Butt doesn't mention is that most of the data is collected from zircon crystals within rocks, which have their radiometric clocks reset when they solidify from a molten state. Any lead is rejected at that point and can only build up within the crystal after they have solidified, as the aforementioned isotopes of uranium decay. So you've got 50 ounces of uranium, half-life at 4.5 billion years. So in 4.5 billion years, that 50 ounces of uranium is going to have broken down into 25 ounces of uranium and 25 ounces of lead, approximately. So if you find a rock that contains 25 ounces of uranium and 25 ounces of lead, then you can calculate that that rock is how old. 
Well, the evolutionists would suggest to us you can calculate that that rock is 4.5 billion years old or so, give or take some uh, technical stipulation. That would be more or less accurate if he was only referring to uranium-238, but he doesn't even mention such trifling details. Nor does he seem to understand that it would be a geologist who conducts such tests, not an evolutionist. What's the problem with that? Uh, the problem with that is it's based on several assumptions that you simply cannot grant the evolutionist. Assumption number one, no daughter element was in the rock to start with. Yes, you can. It's not possible for a zircon crystal to solidify with any lead in it at all. Scientists understand this, which is why uranium lead dating methods are taken seriously by the scientific community. Oh, you see, what if there was some of that lead in the rock to start with? What if 22 or 23 ounces of lead was in that rock to start with. Would that skew your dates a little bit? Now, let's illustrate. Suppose you walk up to someone's pool and you see that it's a 3,000 gallon pool. They are running a hose pipe into it and that hose pipe is pumping 10 gallons an hour. You do some math there. It's a 3,000 gallon pool pumping 10 gallons an hour. Then it's obviously been pumping for up 30, 30 hours or so. Actually, what would it be 300 hours or so rather? So you knock on the door, you say, hello friend, I've done some calculations, I see that you've been running your hose pipe for 300 hours. They say, oh no, no, we haven't been doing that. Last night it was a torrential downpour and it filled our entire pool up, all except 10 gallons. Wow, that must have had something to do with the fountains of the deep. Or maybe God forgot to close a window in the firmament. We've only been running our hose pipe for an hour. <laughs> now your calculations are off just a little bit, aren't they? Because you assumed that there was no water in that pool to begin with. And that was a faulty assumption. Who assumed that exactly? Is it not more reasonable to assume that the neighbor was topping his pool up rather than filling it from empty? Would a neighbor who is that nosy not notice something like that? Is it the case that there could be some lead in the rock? Before that element started breaking down, uranium started breaking down? Sure, certainly could. No, it couldn't. What is it with people who are ignorant of the scientists who claim to know better than the experts?